Most gay men of a certain age experience some form of PTSD, and it's time that we bring it out in the open and talk about it. Welcome to No Two Gays About It, the show for the over 50 gay male, all about things that are important to men, gay, over 50, and hosted by two men who are, yes, over 50. Hi, I'm Tom Burke. And I'm Michael Foley. Every one of us, all of us mature gay men, are living with the trauma that growing up gay and coming of age within or around the AIDS crisis caused us. And today, Michael and I are going to talk about it. First, we're going to discuss the different areas, times, and places in our lives where that trauma was caused. We're also going to take a look at how this trauma manifests itself in our everyday life, both now and also back when we first experienced it. And then finally, we're going to talk about how men our age are dealing with this PTSD and how we can let go of some of it so that we can move past the trauma and start healing. It's another important conversation that all gay men our age should be having. So join Michael and me as we unpack a lot of this trauma that we've been hauling around for years. Hey, but before we get started, could you do us a favor and click like and subscribe and ring our little bell if you want to message when a new video drops. Okay, Michael, before we begin, I just want to say to everybody that Michael and I are not therapists. No. We are not qualified to diagnose anybody for anything. And the only reason we're using this PTSD moniker, post-traumatic stress disorder, is because it really describes what we're talking about. The moment you hear PTSD, everybody knows what that means literally and also emotionally. Absolutely. And whether a gay man has been officially diagnosed or not, we can all agree that we have experienced trauma, pain, sadness, crisis, merely just because we're gay. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But I think we have to first start with, where did this all happen? How did this all happen? When did this all happen? So, Michael, when do you think some of this trauma actually started for those of us who are gay and over 50? Well, I think for us, uh, you know, the time we came out, there was absolutely zero acceptance for our community. Right. So it, it was a struggle for us as young people who had no sense of community or other people who were like us. You know, for me, that was a big one. Well, totally. But I, I think it, I mean, we have to go even farther back. I think this trauma, this pain or confusion started even before we knew that we were actually gay. I mean, we, we all felt we were different. We knew that we didn't fit in, really, and we couldn't talk about it. There was nobody that was able to explain what was happening to us. And so I think it's a lot of self-inflicted trauma that we put on. We didn't feel good enough. We didn't feel like we belonged. So I think that's where it really did start. Is it self-inflicted, though? Because, you know, we did have a society that didn't accept us. Let's drag religion into this conversation. Okay. Um, so is it self-inflicted if, you know, we were younger and we had full acceptance to be who we were? Well, uh, I'm talking about, like, even before we knew what being gay was, we knew we didn't want to chase around the girls and we didn't right. want to, like... We just felt that there was something different about us, and that's where the trauma started. Right. So I do feel that we it's something we put on. But then, obviously, as we're growing even, you know, just a little bit more, then we start getting hit by the trauma inflicted on us by the bullies in school or the people that wanted to call us all of those names. You or know. family. <laughs> Right. And definitely family yeah. as well. But I think it, you know, it, it started when strangers or, you know, people that weren't part of our family or in our inner circle were starting to say words to us. And obviously it comes because they didn't understand either. You know, we're different and it, anybody who's different is going to be bullied or made fun of. Um, but you're right. School, not school, families. Yeah. Because you know what? No one called me faggot more than my brother. Wow. Probably from the time I was five or six years old. So, wow. 
Wow. Yeah, for me, that's where it really started. It wasn't school. I don't think I was called a fag in school until probably eighth grade, maybe ninth. Yeah. yeah. And and your brother's younger than you, correct? No, he's a year older than I am. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was younger yeah. than you. Okay. Um, yeah, wow. That that hurts. Yeah. Um, but not only, you know, being called faggot or whatever from our family members, but also our parents kind of squashing any sort of yeah. flamboyancy <laughs> or, you know, uh, whatever. It's like, no, stop doing that. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. So again, this, this trauma is just being built up and built up and built up from all different places. But I, I truly believe it, it did start with ourselves, you know, and then with our moms telling us that we're not good enough, your brother not telling you that you're not good enough, yeah. that's making us start to believe that and start bringing on more of that pain and sadness. Without a doubt, yeah. Because um, again, if I look back, it, it all, mine all stems from family. Um, because yeah. by the time I was in school, I had already retreated inside of myself. So there was, there was a wall that nobody was getting through. Right. Um, and add religion to that because, you know, um, an Italian Catholic... So well, tell me know, about it. Uh, uh, I'm the Irish Catholic. I get it, you know, and I went to Catholic schools forever. Um, and yet, it, I mean, we're not going to go into this whole thing, but yeah, I w we had those priests that were kind of like touching us inappropriately and stuff. And so that's okay, but I can't skip down the street like fuck right. you, you know, <laughs> or play with a doll if you want to play with a doll or cook. I love oh to, my to God. cook. All right, so here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you into a little bit of the darkness in my mind. Um, my sisters, I have two older sisters, and they both had Barbie dolls. And uh, at whatever, they're older than I am. And, and at some point, they were put up into the attic. And I used to climb up into the attic and dress up their, do their dolls. You know, like, if, if my mother saw me doing that, ooh, you know... So right there, I'm putting that trauma on myself of like, oh my God, I, for some reason, I really enjoy doing this, but it's so wrong. Well, because you got to, you know, you were being creative, you were dressing these things sure. up and using your imagination. And it's sadly, again, that's not self-inflicted, the shame you feel, it comes from outside of you, um, you know, where it's like, you're a boy, you're not supposed to be doing that. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, stuff like that scars and leaves really, really deep cuts that you know sometimes we don't allow to heal completely and then as we keep aging you know i went a different route than you did and i was in high school dating all the girls and going to all the dances and trying to be that guy uh you know so that itself is just piling on this like sadness that i'm not i'm not who i'm supposed to be or whatever and and for so many men you know, luckily I did finally get away and got to come out and be who I was. But for so many men, they never did. You know, they had to live with that same trauma pretty much all their lives. Or even if know? they did, they didn't deal with, like I said, there's deep wounds. They didn't deal with that pain. You just sort of block it out and move forward. Right. And I think that's where the PTSD comes into play. Because if you don't heal... You can't move. Exactly. And as we're discussing, it was just layer and layer yeah. and layer upon pain and sadness and not feeling good enough or right or, you know, all of this trauma. So if you didn't heal that little boy stuff from when you were four or five years old and you're just piling it on, it's just getting more and more. And for us, I'm 63 years old. When I started to come into my sexuality, AIDS was starting. Yeah. And that, <laughs> like the whole AIDS crisis, you know, nobody knew what it was. It was, it was horrible. And that... And it, if you chose to be out, you were automatically tied. You're gay, you have AIDS. Yeah. Or, and it, it, again, it was another societal pressure that literally was crushing and so unfair in so many ways. And again, it's another one of those walls we built up.
Or right. for a lot of us, we just, there were a lot of gay men who I know who are my age who stayed in the closet until their 20, late 20s, 30s, 40s, because of that stigma that was attached to, oh, you're gay, you have AIDS. Oh my God, I totally understand that. You know, we all were in such fear. And for those of us my age, a little bit younger, you as well, you know, we were just coming into sexuality. We were just realizing what sex is and being gay and all of that stuff. And then to have this like, oh, but if you act on it, you're going to be dead tomorrow. Yeah, because let's know? be real. That was the first time for a lot of us that we felt complete freedom when we found our tribe. And to all of a sudden have this massive weight put on top of that and the stigma and the hate that right. was directed at the community. Not that there wasn't always hate there, but this was a whole nother level because all of a sudden you were a pariah. Yeah. In a whole yeah. different way. And it really did affect men who were a little bit older than we were. You know, those are the men that we lost that had found their freedom. And then this disease hit and took all of, not all of them, but so many of them away from us. And so, you know, for all of us at this certain age, whether it was you came into your sexuality right before this crisis or as we did during the crisis or even after the crisis, it affected us. It put more of this trauma. And, and you know this more than anybody. You watched people die. You watched yeah. people disappear. And for, for me, I came out when I was 18. So that was in 1981. So... The age crisis hasn't hit, hadn't hit, so I, I, it was once I was out that all of a sudden this 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 monster came into the community. Right. So, um, and eighty percent of the people that I knew um, when I came out and who were family, because again you're experiencing something for the first time, and there's this sense of freedom. They're no longer here, and you know we've had many conversations and. I am still amazed to this day how much that impacts me in particular moments. Like all of a sudden a floodgate will open and I experience this grief. And um, that's, Which that's, is, I, that's still something I don't think I will ever move beyond. Well, I don't think any of us can move beyond the fear that was put upon us at that moment. Um, that moment meaning years of just like, what? if we were to live our authentic selves, we're going to be dead. If you, you know, and, and for you, again, you lived a different life. You were out and you were proud and you were fighting where so many men were not allowed to do that. You know, as you said, if when this AIDS crisis happened, if you, if anyone even thought you were gay, they're like, oh, don't, don't come near me, don't touch yep. me, don't breathe on me, because you're going to give me the AIDS. Like, you, you couldn't know? even shake somebody's hand. Yeah. And for so many of those men who were in graduate school or in, uh, you know, medical school or law school or who are starting their engineering careers, coming out at that moment during the AIDS crisis would have ruined them completely you know, would have ruined the trajectory that they had planned for their lives. So some men could get out there and fight, but other men just could not, you know, not that they didn't want to, but it would have completely ruined them. Well, and in, in crisis situations, we all handle things differently. Right. You know, mine was this just massive wave of anger. And I think a lot of that was tied to so many years of not being able to be who I was. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm out, I'm happy for the first time in my life and experiencing all this great stuff. Like again, my first gay pride in New York was just, it still to this day gives me goosebumps. And then to have that happen um, it, and to see the way the people in the community were being treated just made me so angry that all I could do was fight. Yeah. It, it was such a, I don't know. I mean, I, 
It was such a traumatic thing, but for me, it was also traumatic being a young boy and having your sister's boyfriend say, call me a fag. Yeah. You know, all of these different layers that we all have been through has really hardened us in a way. Um, and like you said, so many walls were put up, so many people retreated and were never really able to come out of this. Um, can I just, can I say this really quick? Yeah. Because I don't want people to think that we're saying our pain was worse than anybody else's. No. Because it wasn't. Our pain was very different. Our situation was very different. The 80s and 90s were very different for us because it added a whole nother layer on top of coming to grips with your sexuality and being who right. you are and embracing who you are and acceptance from the outside world. Because it didn't exist during that little period of time because people were so afraid of of what AIDS was. Right. But, you know, it didn't end there either. Uh, the AIDS crisis continued. And then finally, you know, the drug cocktails and all yeah. of the stuff, we finally saw light at the end of whatever dark, dark tunnel we were in. But then, you know, this trauma kept getting put on top of us. You know, even... Um, having to fight for our equal rights, still being treated as if we were less than, you know, that beer swigging, fat, white guy driving around with his Confederate flag, like he's better than us because he's straight, you know, like, it was just constantly this stuff being thrown at us. Yeah. Um, and that was something the previous generations fought for as well. Um you know, because you had the gay liberation movement, you had all these amazing organizations in the 50s and 60s where people were finally was like, Fuck this, I'm being who I, 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 I am. Um, and we were just starting to gain some ground in the 70s and early 80s. And then all of a sudden, just yeah. it was like a bucket of water being thrown on, uh, on all of us in the community, you know. And it, it was just a very different time. And there's so and much to unpack for men our age in regard to that. Like, again, we're in our 20s, early 20s, and we're losing friends from this horrific disease. And if there's anybody out there who is younger, because I know we have some younger listens out, listeners out there, please go and watch a documentary about what that time period was like, because it may give you a little bit more insight into what Tom and I are talking about in regard to a different kind of trauma, because people were literally walking skeletons with lesions all over their bodies. Oh, yeah. And, and that anytime, doesn't go away. It was a war. We were in a war. And, for and that all doesn't of go us, away. Like you coughed and you're like, oh my God, do I have it? Yeah. Am I go? Is this it? Uh, yeah. But also, I also want to stress that yes, this. We're not just talking about AIDS, though. We're talking about all these different layers of trauma that we have built up, which is why we at this age, so many of us are experiencing this PTSD, which obviously, you know, you can see in the emotions in, in your face and in the, the way you're talking. You definitely are. Let's move along. We get where this happened to us. But let's talk now about... How is this trauma, this PTSD, how is it manifesting in our lives? And one thing that you said, um, I still see in you, you know, that you were so angry. Yeah. And you're still angry. I am. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that's, that's been a struggle. I think acknowledging it for me is, is the biggest hurdle initially. Um, and, you know, a lot of that has come through the conversations we've had. Yeah. Um, during the course of the show, because we get to be vulnerable and we get to have conversations that you normally don't have. And that's why we wanted to do this. So other people can continue the conversation. Um, but I do harbor still so much anger in regard to that. And there is a fear of letting that out because you, it's like grief. Um, you feel like you, you'll never be able to stop it. So right. the floodgate will open a little bit. You get a little release in a moment, and then it shuts again, and it's still there. And that's a, that's a tough one for me. 
And also grief, um, because we have experienced so much loss, so much of this tra trauma, uh, it comes out in grief as well. Like, you know, we can see the pain in you. We can see that. We can hear that in your voice. And and when we are confronted with a different loss or different kind of grief, it pulls up that same grief that is already there. Right. So anger and grief. One big thing, we did a whole show on this, um, but this is a, a way that this PTSD is manifesting is through the addictions in our community. Without a doubt. So many men our age, older, have issues with alcohol and drugs and sex and eating disorders. And it does stem from everything we're talking about. I mean, just you and I just talking about this now, and I'm thinking like, oh yeah, we had trauma when we were four or five, and then when we went to school, and then from our family, and then from people in high school, and then coming out, and like, oh my God, I'm starting to, <laughs> to like, have I need a little, drink. <laughs> I, I need, some, yeah, like shoot me up some with something. It's sometimes um, it's exhausting. Right. And you know, a lot, like you said, a lot of guys our age have, numbing has become the norm. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe eventually you won't have to deal with it. You'll just, you'll just, you know, you'll leave this plane of existence carrying it with you. But um, through, like I said, through the course of this, I've, I've learned to be more open in regard to the pain that I feel. Um, and it's a challenge. And like, you, sometimes I'll just burst out crying. I've done this to you, where I'll yeah. talk about a friend who's no longer here, and I just will lose it. So obviously, there's something there that I still need to come sure. to grips with. So let me ask you, back in the day when the AIDS crisis was happening, did you see a lot of people numbing? Oh, with I, I was yeah. one of them initially. Okay. I think for the first couple of years of it, when I was involved in activism, I would do what I needed to do, but then I would go out and party with friends and get drunk just to have a few hours of relief because right. it was so hard and so heavy. Yeah. Um, you know, we would do a movie night at the Gay Men's Health Crisis because a lot of these guys couldn't go out into public anymore because they had these massive lesions on their faces and their arms and were walking skeletons. So... They didn't want to go out in public. So it created a space for them to feel safe. And, yeah. you know, when you leave that, you do need relief. Right. Um, and for me, there were many years where it was alcohol. Um, and fortunately, I dealt with a lot and was able to let go of that. Um, but yeah, there's still so much grief I don't really deal with. And it surprises me all the time. And I'm assuming you find this too, because we've had conversations here where you were f physically treated inappropriately in a church setting. And that, I can't even imagine what that grief is right. like for you. You want to share a little bit of that? Well, uh, you know, as I said, um, what got me and... I. I was a really intelligent young kid. I have a really high IQ. I was really smart. I knew what was going on. That was the, I think that was the hardest part. Yeah. That I saw what, especially this one priest was doing. And it was okay. But it wasn't okay for me or my friend Greg to be a little not butch or whatever. You know, like... That was where it was, wait a minute. And I think that also started me putting on myself, I'm not good enough. There is something wrong with me. So that started that grief as well. Um, How about anger? Because uh, somebody is taking something from you without your permission. Did, did that, Well, did you experience anger? Do you experience anger? I wasn't angry at that situation. I was angry when it happened later in my life. Uh, like I said, this has happened a number of times in, in my world, and mainly because for so many years 
I had put myself out there. I was, you know, people thought that they could just touch me and do things, you know, whatever that I was, because I was, it doesn't matter. But, you know, I got angry then. I, when I was older, I was angry. Um, and also then got a little bit bitter about things. Yeah. And that is something that we see now how this PTSD is manifesting in men our age and older is that whole vein of bitterness that so many men have, that bitchy thing. Um, Which comes from hurt. Exactly. You know? I mean, we had to, again, look back. It, it started so young and layers and layers yeah. and layers of this pain and trauma we're putting on top of us. So if we lash out first, no one's going to lash us, right. lash out at us. If we, you know, strike first, if we, uh, or if we just like say whatever you want and just be like bitty, bitty, bitter, and that whole like bitchy, queeny, whatever kind of thing um, is just a defense, right? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's our go-to, it, you know, somebody attempts to hurt you, you're going to lash back and usually sure. it's harder. So it, it stops it and it's tracks. And so many of, so many of us learn to strike first, you know, and I could, when I was in my twenties and I was, you know, kind of in the public eye thing, I, I knew if I, I, it wasn't that I was bitchy, but I was very like, I could put someone in their place. It, without being a bitch or without, without being queenie, because I, of course, had to be high, hidden. I couldn't be who I was anyway. But I learned if I did that first, then they wouldn't come after me. Um, and I just see that now that so many men our age and older, again, are just continuing that um, because they have built all of these walls, all of these walls to protect themselves. And it's so sad to see that now to see a guy in his 70s or even 80s who are like still not being comfortable with who they are because of what was piled on top of them or who is angry and the, they you don't know how to process it um well i, yeah, I think I is, mean, is a big challenge as well right definitely i mean definitely the anger thing is, is a big thing but also in the this like just building walls and not being authentic because we're still not feeling like we're good enough um another thing another way that this is manifesting now unfortunately is in this real rivalry or jealousy of younger gay men because they didn't have it as bad as we did you know, um, I mean, how great is it to to see families surrounding their young gay kids and go like, you go, girl, <laughs> you do or you. E even just watching television. My God, you can't watch a television show now without a gay character, right. without a, a gay storyline. And that is so amazing. And, you know, that's why I want to challenge some of the guys who are our age to look at that. And, and yeah, you could be a little bit jealous. We all get jealous, right? But there's there's a, a happy jealousy, you know, where it's like, oh, I wish I had that. I didn't. But to realize we did that. Our fight, our struggle made it easier for this younger generation. And I, that's, such a, that's such a remarkable accomplishment because not a lot of generations can say that, especially in such a short period of time. Because right. in the last 20 years, the LGBTQ community, um, acceptance has gone from basically nil to over 70% of the country. And that doesn't happen usually that quickly. Right. But I totally understand this kind of bitter jealousy that so many older men have when you do see these younger kids getting to live their authentic lives, watching TV shows with guys being all different levels of gay and be, you know, to be like, especially with these layers of PTSD uh, on top of us. It's not easy to be like, oh, good for you. You know, uh, there are a lot of times where I'm like, F you, <laughs> you have no idea how I had to hide who I was. Yeah. And then when I had a little bit of power to be, be able to then step forward and fight for you guys, but I still had to go through a lot of shit and you guys don't get it. 
you know. Um, so yeah, I think I them, get... the not, them not getting it is what makes me annoyed. Um, them yeah. having it doesn't. But them going, oh, you should just stop talking about the 80s and 90s. It's like, I will never stop talking about the 80s and 90s because there are people here who are your age. Who, there are people who aren't here who are your age and died right. at the age right. you were because of this disease. And you think it's an easy thing now because you could take a pill. And so, again, I really want to challenge anybody out there who is under the age of 50 or 45 to go back and watch a documentary and see what your community dealt with because it will change you for the rest of your life. Hey guys, it's Tom. You know, I've been working in front of cameras for about 40 years and I've learned some incredible lessons. The first is the importance of lighting. It is amazing what the right lighting can do. And the second is the importance of taking care of your skin and using a really good skincare line. And I just found Alder New York. Their products are clean and healthy and they've been developed for all skin types and all ages. I used the Gentle Cleanser earlier and my skin still feels really great. It's not tight and dry like so many other cleansers can do. And you know what the best part about Alder New York is? It's queer owned and operated. So not only can you support the health of your skin, but you can also support our community. And the folks over at Alder are going to give you guys a great deal. Jump on over to our link, which is at www.aldernewyork.com slash no two gays about it. Don't forget that slash no two, the number two gays about it. And they will give you 10% off your entire purchase. Save money. Take care of your skin and support our community? That's a win win win. And there's no two gays about it. How do we deal with this PTSD? How do we move forward? And because again, you are stuck in this AIDS crisis anger world. Um, and you need to figure out how to work through this so that you could, you can like release some of this and you can start healing. So I want to ask you like, what have you done to move past this? Well, I talk about it. Okay. Which is helpful. But again, there's, I think there's a level that will never outgrow and will never leave us. But I think the more we talk about it, the easier it gets. And then you know, I do allow myself the opportunity to cry, um, which a lot of guys our age don't, or to express anger. And I think right. finding a community or a, a group of people who surround you and don't judge you when that stuff comes up is hugely important. Because um, again, this will never leave me. Right. Having no, the I'm best friends, uh, you know, in, in life when you first come out who are no longer here because of inaction of a government who actually in press conferences were making jokes about it is hard. You can't let that go because it's always there. But talking about it has helped me. So I'm not asking you to, to you know, forget about it because there's no way any of us can ever yeah. forget what we went through. But we can also never forget what we rent, went through as children in, in grammar school and in high school and, you know, even pa past the AIDS crisis. But you do are holding a lot of anger for this one period of time. Have you ever, like, seen a therapist? Have you worked oh, with yeah. somebody? That's, that's what's funny. So this is, again, one of those situations where we're so completely opposite. Because from what I hear from you, a lot of your stuff is tied to that younger self. For me, that that was an easy release. Um, my younger self and all that stuff I went through before I came out, that my trauma, that stuff was mostly taken care of um, right. through therapy, through, you know, my spiritual path, through that stuff. But it's the, it's the stuff after I came out that is still hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, so at younger trauma, isn't isn't my baggage anymore but right for a lot of guys it is which that's right. the point of this show we all have that and it manifests itself differently for you a lot of that stuff is tied to your younger self 
Well, actually, Michael, it's not. Oh, I mean, okay. we're discussing all the different levels of PTSD, of trauma that we've been through. But I have worked through um, a lot of this. I, I did seek the help. I knew that there were issues, um, not only with being young and then coming of age during AIDS and then, you know, trying to figure out who I am now. I've worked through a lot of this stuff. I have not forgotten any of it. Um, so do you experience grief at particular, like you mentioned, um, seeing the younger kids today, right? And you're like, yeah. well, fuck you. So do you have those moments that's t like, for me, what, what mine's tied to? What is, what is yours mostly tied to? Well, I don't think it's tied to anything because I've kind of really put the work into it to move forward from this. However, I mean, as I said, it's not going away. It's still there. I'm just dealing with it in a different way. I definitely think talking about it, communicating, talking to other people who get it. But I also feel it's really important to talk about to people who don't get it uh, so that they understand um, kind of where I'm coming from in a way. And yeah, when I watch television and I see some of these young gay guys working, I'm like, fuck you, because I didn't have that opportunity. But as I said, once I got to a place where I could step forward and help them get you know, get these opportunities. I, I feel really great about that. So I, I am a big proponent on therapy and talking with somebody who can give you the tools when you do feel yourself spiraling to then kind of move into the mode of like, I need to take care of this instead of spiraling into it, which so many people do. And that's where support groups are helpful too, right? Oh, to, to, oh, find a, yeah. to find a support group where they're, that does deal with trauma of that period in time is, yeah. is hugely helpful. But you also want to make sure that you're not finding a support group where it's just all going to be whining victims. Oh, without you a doubt, know. a support group should help you move on, not yeah. sit, wallow in whatever it is you're dealing with. You know, you want yeah. somebody who's leading it or who's the facilitator to be able to say, Okay, you talked about the same thing for the last couple of months now. How do we move beyond it? Right. And but unfortunately so many facilitators are also whining victims. They love to do, you know, let's all just be big Karens and complain about everybody else. We're perfect. Uh so yeah, you have to make sure that you're finding the right support group, but I think they are amazing things to to share experiences with other people that you don't have to like explain a lot. But another thing that I think it, as I said, communicating and talking about this. And I think a, a really great thing for you would be to kind of create some sort of program that you can teach the younger generations of what we went through. You yeah. know, like... Ironically enough, um, I was just going to mention these two really good friends who I, who I have that are a couple and they're 28 and 29. And we talk about this stuff all the time. Um, because they they are so unaware of what it was like, right? Um, and you know, conversations like that is what starts healing, I think, and understanding. Because you have these these two guys who, for their whole life, basically being out was fine, you know. Um, yeah, and to realize that there were struggles before you got here, <laughs> you know. Um, and again, not that one is better or worse than the other. It's just, it, I think the more we talk with each other, the more understanding we have toward other people. And to, to me, that's the best way to heal trauma and to, to move, at least move on, but never forget. Yeah. And as I said, there's no way that any of us can ever forget any of this trauma that we've been through, whatever level it was, yeah. whatever age we were at. Or whatever it encompasses. You know, yeah. Whether it was sexual assault, whether whether it was the AIDS crisis for me, whether it was your the way your family treated you, whether it was religion, we just have to learn how to move past this, not forgetting it, but move past holding on to this. Learn a a better way, get the tools to kind of move past and through this, so that we can start healing, so that more men our age and older are not you know, falling into addictions or yep. being those catty, bitchy, bitter queen people because of this. I think we as a community, as with everything, we have to be there for each other. And I think... With compassion. 
totally. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, also, yes, compassion, but we also have to give grace to each other. And you ourselves. Know, like, well, totally to yeah. ourselves. But that's the hardest thing. You know, first we have to give it to others. You know, like, um, even giving it to those bullies that were making fun of us, mm -hmm. they were only doing it because they didn't understand. You know, same thing with a lot of people during the AIDS uh, crisis. Nobody knew what was happening. So was it wrong for them to look at us and go like, don't breathe near me because I don't want to die? Yes, that was wrong. But they also did not understand. And a lot of people did come back around. Um, not everybody. But what are other ways do you feel that we can kind of work through this PTSD? Maybe it's just allowing those floodgates to open and feeling, and I'm guilty of this, feeling everything it is you're feeling in regard to that period of time and whatever, whatever your trauma was, to sort of immerse yourself into it and sort of like walking through the fire, right? Right. That's why, you know, all these indigenous cultures have the fire walking exercise. It is such a healing process. And um, I, I think that might be a huge tool for a lot of us. Well, as long as we do use it as a tool to walk through the fire and not keep going back into the fire. Or stop because, halfway. Well, right? that's exactly then what happens, it. You know? Because so many of us, um, with our traumas, we find comfort in being uncomfortable. We find comfort in being sad. We find comfort in being, you know, whatever trauma we were put upon. And people want to go back there. You know, so if you're going to go back there to wallow in it, yeah. that's not really serving you. But if you're going to go back there to move through it and find a way to the other end, again, without forgetting any of this, because none of us should or could ever forget what we've been through, but just learn how to deal with it and, and bring it to the other side so that we can heal and we can be more complete human beings. What do you what do you see as a, a good tool to give our our listeners like to put into their toolbox and allow them to move on? Well, I think we mentioned it. I think one of the very first things is acknowledgement, is to acknowledge that what we went through, um, and when we start feeling those feelings, to acknowledge those feelings and be like, yes, this is what I'm feeling, and yes, it's okay to feel this. But I'm not going to take it as far as sometimes I do, uh, because I want to move through it and go past it. So definitely acknowledgement. And then for me, as I said, big proponent of talking with people who do have the tools. Like I said earlier, I have no tools, you know, <laughs> like I, I can't give any sort of advice to anybody yeah. because we're all different in individuals. And I think that's something else I learned in therapy is that every person has a different pathway. Well, that's a everybody... perfect tool in itself then, isn't it? To realize yep. you don't have all of the answers. Right. right? That to, and... to let go of that. You don't need to know the answer. Right. But sometimes it's going to take you a while to find it. You may never find it, but that's okay. Right. And not to put the blame on everybody else and whatever, you know, like, oh, it's the bully's fault, or it's my mom's fault, or it's the priest's fault, or it's, you know, no. Everyone was just doing what they were trained or, or kind of told or whatever. It, it's such an individual thing. Yeah. Um, but we as a community need to help each other and kind of, yes, talk about it. But also... Talk about that we have this trauma, you know? Yes. So many of us are like, no, no, I'm fine. It's all good. I'm Let go fine. of the and shame. Then we go home. Let go of yeah. the shame. Shame. That's another thing that I don't think any of us yeah. can ever really get rid of. Um, it's all around us for our whole lives. Uh, but we have to learn how to kind of acknowledge and move through that as well. Um, yeah, it, this is a lot. And as we said, we are not here to solve problems, but just to start conversations. And, you know, if you and your friend group just want to start talking like, hey, do you feel any of this crap? Yeah. Be like, oh, my God, I thought I was the only one. You know, that helps. So 
We're just starting this conversation, gentlemen. It's your job to take it and run with it, right? Absolutely. And, you know, like you've been doing, send us your comments, send us your input, oh, please. send us your thoughts, send us your feelings. We, we can't tell you what a privilege that is for us to read. It, it is a privilege. Uh, and thank you all for doing that. But also, as I've said before, one of my favorite things about your comments are when you comment to each other and you're saying, oh my God, me too. Yeah. Or this is how I just, you know, have felt trauma, or this is how I'm experiencing PTSD. It's great to watch you guys continue this conversation with us. So, and something I'm going to ask all of you to do for us as well is spread the word about us. Uh, tell your friends. If you like us, if you think we're great, well, we're not that great, but if you like the conversations that we're having, you know, tell your friends. Spread the word so that more and more and more gay men can join us in this conversation. Have us have them jump over to YouTube and watch us or Patreon or wherever it is. Michael, how else can people kind of get in touch with us? You guys could hit us up across social media at the moniker No Two Gays About It. And just remember, it's the number two. That includes Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, threads, uh, YouTube all of the above. Um, and if you would like to support us in a different way and become a contributor to our show, hop over to our Patreon at uh, patreon.com forward slash no two gays about it. Find a tier that works for you and help us keep these conversations going because as Tom and I have found out just in our relationship, um, it's grown a lot. There's been a lot of growing pains as well, but having the conversation is half the battle. So, uh, yeah, check us out. Yeah, please do that. Um, and really want to thank all of you for coming on this journey with Michael and I. It's been such a learning experience for all of us. We so appreciate all of you out there. Um, and make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you leave us comments. It's going to keep us moving forward. So thank you all for that as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have some special people to thank, correct? We do. We want to thank uh, Ted Zalewski, David Tiley, and John Bonasante, who are our Patreon supporters at the executive producer role. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank really you. appreciate you. But as I said, we appreciate all of you out there. Um, all right, Michael. So this has been a heavy topic today. Um, I think we need to kind of keep unpacking and let this go and move forward so thank you very much for sharing all of your inner trauma with us yeah, really thank you as well that. yeah sure all right well until next time michael until next time tom thank you and thank you guys for listening thanks hey thanks so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe and if you like what you saw check out some of our other videos